Nosweiter, Kloisur de Gefli, good evening and welcome to Hay and um, to uh, tonight's lecture, which is uh, the collaboration with the University of Wales, Prince of St. David's Inspire, and the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment, UK and Ireland. Um, delighted to welcome here today the winner of the annual lecture. Uh, she is Rachel Dowes, um, and she won it with a, a lecture called Starling Song, The Nations of, uh, uh, of Meaning. Um, she currently works for, a, uh, for Ecoactive, which is a small environmental charity based in Hackney. She is joined on stage by Jane Davidson, who was uh, the former Government Minister for Sustainability, the Welsh Government Minister for Sustainability, England still doesn't even have one, um, and is, the, uh, is now the University of Wales, for instance, say David, Pro Vice Chancellor for Sustainability and Engagement, and is also a Director of Inspire. Uh, also with us today we have Professor Brooklyn Carey, who is the Professor of English at Northumbria University and is also Chair of ASLE UK. Hi. Please would you give them all a warm hey welcome. Well, good evening everybody. Naswitha Ihigid. I am not the winner. <laughs> this is the winner. This is Rachel. So, yes, go for it. As, as Andy said, um, uh, my name is Jane Davidson and um, I work in the University of Wales Trinity St David. And about five years ago, ASLE UKI and um, Professor Bracken Carey here is the chair of ASLE UKI held their annual conference in our university. And for me, as an English literature graduate, interested in the environment and sustainability, I knew nothing about this organization, but I realized that I really wanted to work with them. So on the spot, in Lampeter, five years ago, we designed a competition. And that competition was open to anyone to write a really good lecture to be given in Hay. And this is the prize for the best lecture. And every year for the last five years, we have had stunning lectures under the banner of INSPIRE, the Institute for Sustainable Practice, Innovation and Resource Effectiveness, or INSPIRE, a great name, two glasses of red wine, and we populated the letters. <laughs> But anyway, here we are tonight, and I'm absolutely delighted that once again, we have an extraordinary evening for you with a fantastically talented young writer who's going to talk about murmurations. And those of us who've seen murmurations know that they are one of the most extraordinary sights possible. So we remain committed as a university to supporting uh, this lecture every year. He remains committed, and I'm delighted that you have come to see the next generation of impressive, exciting nature writing. And before you get a chance to, to hear Rachel uh, speak um, uh, in the context of her lecture, I'm just going to hand over to Professor Bracken Carey to say a little bit about our partner organisation. But Djokhva Jan and Dord, thank you so much, all of you, for coming on this very special evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a, a wonderful to be here uh, again. This is my second Hay Festival uh, in, the, in the chair alongside our prize winner. And um, it's been going on longer than I've been uh, um, ch chair of ASLI. Uh, we are an organisation primarily of academics. We do academic stuff, so we teach and we read and we research and so on. We uh, produce a journal called Green Letters. We um, hold a conference every year. One year it's for graduate students and the other year it's for everybody. Um, and uh, these are held all over the place. So uh, we're, we're in um, 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 Sheffield this year and in the Orkneys next year, which is going to be very exciting because it's a part of the country few people go to. Um, we are almost 20 years old, so as academic societies go, perhaps not the oldest, but we are finally coming up to uh, a respectable age. If you're interested in finding out more, it's very, very simple. Uh, you can type ASLE, A-S-L-E, into 
uh, any search engine, what you'll get is the United States version of A-S-L-E, ASLE. So just put in A-S-L-E and then U-K-I, because we are ASLE, United Kingdom and Ireland, and you'll get uh, information there about all of our activities and uh, how, to, how to join. That's uh, ASLE. That's not what you came here to listen <laughs> about. Um, you came here to hear Rachel talk about starlings. Now, this competition has been going on for, um, I think, five years now. We had this year the largest number of entries to the competition, so it was a very strong field. Um, the judges um, read all of them with great interest. There was some excellent um, um, work from, um, from creative writers as well as academic writers. Um, but we were unanimous in, uh, uh, in choosing uh, Rachel's essay. We thought uh, it was a wonderful piece of work. It was notable for uh, the quality of its writing, the, um, uh, the, the depth of its research, but more than anything else, it was the, uh, the, the, the entry that the judges enjoyed reading the most. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's why... Um, and thank you for coming to see this on this very appropriately decorated stage. Um, so, I'd already decided to speak about starlings the day one flew in through my kitchen window. I was eating breakfast, feeling guilty, when there was a tapping sound from the draining board, and there it was, pecking jerkily at a sponge. It was April, and its dark feathers still held traces of their white tips, but they were far less striking than in winter. This one had been ducking in and out of holes looking for nest sites, polishing the pale spots from its plumage. That meant it was probably a male, although its beak was still a muddy brown, so I couldn't be sure. In the breeding season, starling beaks turn bright yellow, apart from the base, which startlingly is blue for boys and pink for girls. The males start off nests in suitable holes to attract females, decorating them with lavender, daisies and daffodils. The pair then completes the nest together, including fresh greenery to keep away parasites. It was a warm day, and the dark oil slick of his feathers shone green, purple, and gold. Oily seems to be the word most frequently associated with starlings, that and bully. An unpleasant image, but hard to avoid. Their feathers reflect just the same colours as an oily puddle, with a similar sense of uneasy beauty. If he'd stuck around, the locations of the, those colours on his small body would have told me where he'd come from. Instead, he shot out of the tiny gap of the open window and was gone. It's hard not to ascribe meaning to these things. A bird in the house can mean death. In my case, it felt like a blessing. If nothing else, it was subject matter. After all, starlings are dull, common birds, or rather, the European starling, Sternus vulgaris is. Vulgaris means common, not vulgar, as you might think, but it's hard to forget either interpretation. Taxonomic taxonomically, our starling has many relatives, uh, most of them far more colorful. The African Cape starling is a bright glossy blue with startling yellow eyes. Hildebrandt starling adds orange and purple to the mix, while the superb starling's name speaks for itself. For sheer ground coverage, though, Bulgaris wins hands down. Their natural habitat stretches from Mongolia and Nepal across to Iceland and the Canary Islands, covering everywhere between apart from Uzbekistan. Those in the far north migrate south in the summer, but a thick band through the middle of Europe, including the UK, are resident all year. Why starlings? Well, I'm not the first. Pliny the Elder would mention starlings in a capacity I'll return to later, and Aristotle used it as a basis of size comparison with other species. John Aubrey, who was amongst other things a 17th century pioneer archaeologist, claimed that starlings were sacred to the Druids, arguing that the small holes left in the stones of Stonehenge were put there deliberately for starlings to nest in. The many problems with this theory include the fact that Druidism did not develop until after the building of Stonehenge, and that while the Welsh for starling is Drydwy, this has nothing to do with Druids and actually means precious egg. Quite, quite what Druids and starlings thought of each other, if anything, is unclear, although the starlings still nest in Stonehenge while the Druids have to stay behind the fences. <laughs> One does appear in the Mabinogion, um, starlings, not Druids, um, the collection of ancient Welsh stories. It acts as a messenger for Branwen, who's in that picture there, the sister of the King of Britain, who is being abused by her husband. 
Nowadays, their common status means starlings are, at best, ignored by the general population. While they often crop up in literature, it's usually as part of a background detail, adding authenticity but without description. After all, no need to describe a bird everyone knows that can be seen anywhere at any time. Although I found myself surprised by how many people, when they find out I'm researching starlings, reveal they can't identify them, too common for their own good. I promise, though, it's not just me. In 1984, Chris Fear published what is, as far as I can tell, the only serious book focusing exclusively on starlings. It's a useful scientific source, but it's the small touches between the research that fascinate me. Fear's love for the birds is clear, despite the fairly dry scientific discourse. Unexpected exclamations marks are common, as though his enthusiasm for the topic has to be placed on the page somehow. He also has a tendency to anthropomorphise. Time and again, when conf confronted with a behaviour which is so far unexplained, he begins down the road of a more human-centric explanation that they shape themselves after a confrontation to relieve tension, that their occasional inconsistent use of a particular call when distressed is quite simply that, a call of distress, with no other obvious benefit for the species, or that their habit habitual but incomplete covering of eggs when leaving the nest is ritualistic. He can't commit to it, backing away with the self-admonition that this is anthropomorphism and anthropomorphism is bad, yet always there's the tendency to edge towards it. He even suggests that the bird is a cheerful one. After all, it sings for no reason. Other endearing touches include the onomatopoeia required to transcribe the starling's various calls, including chaka chaka, prrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
It's also very difficult to convince yourself that the bird has no idea what it's saying, especially in cases which West mentions, where one mashes two phrases together to form a new one which still makes sense. The birds that Pliny described could apparently speak in both Latin and Greek and practiced diligently and spoke new praises every day in still longer sentences. <laughs> in the Mabinogion, Branwyn taught her starling to not only speak, but understand her, giving it verbal instructions on how to find her brother. Speaking starlings even shot in Shakespeare once in Henry IV, Part I, Act I, Scene Three. And this is Hotspur. Nay, I will, that's flat. He said he would not ransom Mortimer, forbade my tongue to speak of Mortimer, but I will find him when he lies asleep, and in his ear I'll holler, Mortimer. Nay, I'll have a starling shall be taught to speak, nothing but Mortimer, and give it him to keep his anger still in motion. This fictional starling from a throwaway line would become incredibly important. In 1880, Eugene Schieflin, a member of the American Acclimatization Society, decided to try and introduce every bird mentioned in Shakespeare's works to the New World as a sort of misguided culturing enterprise. Shakespeare mentions many birds, most of them far more often than the starling's single quote. But only the starling had the right characteristics to not just survive, but thrive in America. Schieflin released around 100 into New York Central Park over the course of two years. Today, starlings cover the entire continent of North America and are one of only three species with no legal protection against hunting and killing them. On autumn and winter evenings, but I've seen it start to happen in late July, starlings will begin to gather in groups in the early evening. They then fly from their various feeding grounds towards their roosting site. Starlings sleep communally in large roosts, usually in trees. It's thought this protects them from the wind, as well as providing a space where noisy hierarchies can be established and information on feeding sites shared. What remains basically unexplained, however, is the starling's behavior just before roosting. Other roosting birds, such as rooks, will gather at a site near the roosting spot before all flying up and entering it at once in a great cacophonous cloud. I've seen it, and it's, amazing. it's an amazing spectacle. Um, but apologies to Mark Cocker, but it doesn't hold a candle to starlings. Before coming into roost, these small, uninteresting, disliked birds form a great dense group and swoop around the nest site, each bird moving almost simultaneously with its neighbours, forming huge, beautiful, endlessly shifting shapes in the sky. The ordinarily noisy birds are completely silent, apart from the rushing sound of thousands of wings. They perform these manoeuvres for up to half an hour before all settling into the roost and starting their screeching chatter once again as if nothing has happened. The synchronicity of the flock is vaguely understood as being due to their existence in a state of critical transition, a state which exists throughout nature, biology, chemistry and physics. Brandon Kime, in an article for Wired magazine titled The Startling Science of a Science Starling Memoration, describes these as systems that are poised to tip, to be almost instantly and completely transformed, like metals becoming magnetised or liquids turning into a gas. When a flock turns in unison, it's a phase transition. This beautiful fact is, the beautiful fact is that it's these tiny mistakes in movement each bird makes when copying its neighbours, which causes the shifting patterns. If each bird imitated its partners perfectly, all the movement would be lost. Instead, small mistakes by one individual ripple outwards as others copy it and create the mesmerising effect. The beauty comes from the lack of perfection. However, I only truly understood the power murmurations could hold when I began examining the concept of metaphor. Peter Coates writes that metaphors are commonly used to naturalise humans and humanise non-human nature. Their task is to encourage us to compare otherwise unrelated things. He goes on to argue that metaphorically driven language, heavily freighted with historical and cultural baggage, demonstrates Western thoughts, incorrigible and deep-seated anthropomorphic tendency. Metaphors, so important to the way we think, also illustrate the way we seem incapable of engaging with nature through anything but human terms. I believe the murmuration has great potential as a metaphorical concept. In some places, it is already being used. One journalist, writing at the height of the Occupy movement, argued that People are hyper-connected and super-responsive, much like starling flocks. The connectivity produced by the internet, causing the mass mobilisation of large numbers of people, easily reflects the way each bird, mimicking its closest neighbours, leads to a huge, impressive display. The discursive patterns of enumeration, unfolding through time, give meaning to a huge variety of concepts in our world, as, in as far as we understand them, including the concept of narrative itself and the network of metaphors, which are how we perceive the world. However, the metaphor of murmuration is rarely used. Shockingly, hardly anyone I speak to has heard of it. Murmuration is not a recognised word on Microsoft Office, has no entry on Wikipedia except as a collective noun. 
I had to explain the concept with videos to a friend who had lived his entire life half an hour's walk from one of the best known sites to see it happen. He called it freaky, but others have had a more re profound reaction. In Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, Annie Dillard watches one occur and asks, could tiny birds be sifting through me right now? Birds winging through the gaps between my cells, touching nothing but quickening in my tissues, fleet. It is hard not to be affected by the sight, even on a tiny YouTube window, and I've yet to see a film which retains its original audio and doesn't contain an audible reaction from the filmmaker. From shrieks and gasps from girls in a kayak to stoic noises of approval from old men in Yorkshire, it seems impossible not to react to these birds. And yet, murmurations are strangely absent from our language and understanding, along with knowledge of our long and complicated history with starlings. Perhaps because, like many things, it is only when all the information is seen in aggregate that the full picture emerges. Or maybe it's the everyday nature of the spectacle. Murmurations don't happen in spring and summer when the birds are too busy with the breeding season, but in autumn and winter they occur almost daily, sometimes over urban areas. The dichotomy between a sleepy housing estate and a spectacular natural spectacle happening above is affecting when you watch it on a video set to some inspirational music, but perhaps if it happens over your head every day, interest wanes. All this probably seems unnecessary. Yes, a murmuration could be used as a good metaphor, but the fact that it isn't is not necessarily a huge loss. However, when seen in the context of our current attitudes towards the natural world, the, words murmura the word murmuration's lack of use, along with all its potential connotations, becomes representative of a much larger issue. Um, in his essay, A Counter-Desecration Phrasebook, Robert McFarland describes how, increasingly, we make do with an impoverished vocabulary for nature and landscape, the nuances that are observed by specialised languages, whether scientific or vernacular, are evaporating from common usage. He explains how several words referring to nature were removed from the 2008 edition of the Oxford Junior Dictionary, and argues that, as we further deplete our ability to name, describe and figure per particular aspects of our landscapes, our competence for understanding and imagining possible relationships with non-human nature is correspondingly depleted. Um, he has then gone on to write a book about this called Landmarks, which you may have read. By using the metaphor of a murmuration, we tie ourselves more firmly to our history with the starling. McFarlane, building on an earlier article by Finlay MacLeod, calls for an impossible counter-desecration phrasebook, which would contain all the lost vocabulary needed to help us understand that as well as thinking about landscape and nature, we think with it, and more radically still, that we are thought by it. The murmuration itself is a perfect example of this. In his article, Kaimart argues that starlings may simply be the most visible and beautiful example of a biological criticality that also seems to operate in proteins and neurons, hinting at universal, universal principles yet to be understood. Through their state of critical transition, murmurations link the sciences, the biology of the birds themselves, combined with the similarities between the murmuration and the actions of molecules with history, art, culture, the lines crossing across a realm of human experience, Meanwhile, the huge shifting shape of the flock itself, endless disparate uni units working in unison, can represent the murmuration's own position as a correlation between different forms of thought. However, the spectacle of the murmuration is no longer as dramatic as it once was. Starling numbers in the UK are falling, and falling dramatically. Only a third of all fledglings survive their first year. One explanation occasionally given to, to explain murmurations is that they are signalling the location of the roost to other birds. We can also take it as a signal to us that as we lose the word, we lose another way of engaging with the world. The problem with all this theorising, all these grand concepts and metaphors, is that they only really work when combined with knowledge of the ways in which the starling is important. Their mimicry, their winter spots, their Shakespearean connection, all these little facts that make the starling more to me than just a small, messy brown bird. As we lose both the animal itself and knowledge associated with it, we lose another connection to the natural world. Of course, there's an obvious point behind all this. The simple fact remains, any animal appears important if you study it long enough. As Christopher Fear claims at the beginning of his book on starlings, I suspect that anyone who studies a species of animal for a long time will eventually come to regard that animal as beautiful. Not only beautiful, but relevant, necessary, and incredibly interesting. Starlings are not unique in this. But knowing that anyone can come to the same level of respect for almost any animal does not reflect poorly on the starling. Instead, it shows just how many hidden stories and potential narratives surround us. In answer to the question, why do we need to save all these species anyway, the famous biologist Stephen Jay Gould wrote that as well as conventional answers rooted in practicality and the idea that 
you never know what medical or agricultural use might emerge from species currently unknown or ignored, it is equally important to remember that we relish diversity. We love every slightly different way, every nuance of form and behaviour. And we know the loss of a significant fraction of this gorgeous variety will quench our senses and our satisfactions in any future meaningfully defined in human terms. By explaining at such length the history, biology and metaphorical potential of starlings, or more simply put, their importance, I'm hoping you will go away and think more about them, notice them, pay attention when they're there and miss them when they're gone. On the other hand, if starlings die out, humans will lose a font of knowledge and understanding. And the same is true of any wild thing. I chose starlings, but I could have chosen herons, ash trees, porpoises, blackberries, or conkers, all incidentally on that list of words removed from the 2008 edition of the Oxford Junior Dictionary. Luckily, others are doing it for me. Oh. Um, and when I made this slide, I didn't know this, but both Hugh Warwick and Dave Golson have given talks at Hay um, yesterday and today, so even more relevant than I thought. <laughs> um, the rise of single species studies has been slow but steady. Oh, and Richard Kerridge won this competition previously. So. <laughs> Go into any bookshop and find the nature section, which is obviously often newly established. My own local shop contains personal book-length narratives on bees, reptiles and amphibians, goshawks, badgers, hedgehogs, Hugh Warwick, otters, rooks, swallows, peregrines, salmon, dragonflies, and even beech trees, moorland and weeds. These are not basic field guides or scientific studies like Fears the Starling. Instead, they weave personal narrative and cultural history into the biologi biological knowledge and all make an attempt at the same effect I am trying to achieve, to induct other people into the wonder of their chosen species. It works well. For example, I lived most of my life ignoring the large black birds which gathered in groups on the playing fields near my house. After reading Mark Cocker's Crow Country, they became fascinating and, more importantly, noticeable. The same thing happened after reading Richard Maybe's Beach Combings. Whilst I'm still hazy on my ability to identify a beach, I now look at trees very differently, noticing coppices and mast. Even the smallest piece can have an effect. If you know the one for sorrow rhyme about magpies, you're far more likely to notice them, count them, pay, attention, pay them attention. And once you're in the habit of noticing one species, you begin to spot more, the food source of your chosen animal, its lookalikes or its predators, until eventually it's the environment, the ecosystem itself, which commands your love and respect. And if anyone saw Dave Golson and Hugh Warwick's talks, they do this very effectively. Um, and speaking of, one of these many authors, Hugh Warwick, also realised this potential. He wrote his single species study, Hedgehogs, a Prickly Affair, with the argument in mind that hedgehogs are the most important species in the world. His logic went that hedgehogs were attractive, fascinating, and most importantly, accessible. In his own words, the hedgehog is a gatekeeper to the natural world. He argues that trying to engender a love of nature through charismatic megafauna keeps it distant and inaccessible. He claims that true love is felt for the boy or girl next door, not the pop star or actor. And the hedgehog is the animal equivalent of the boy or girl next door. After his first book, however, he realised that while the hedgehog met my needs, other animals would do it for other people. This is reflected in the species that are the subjects of those personalised studies on the shelves of waterstones. They are generally animals or insects that, in Britain at least, are easily accessible and relatively common. Warwick's second book was a catalogue of those shelves, called The Beauty and the Beast, Britain's Favourite Creatures and the People Who Love Them. It is a series of interviews and encounters with people as obsessed with their chosen species as he is with hedgehogs. People with a lifetime's dedication to a species, who had to convince them of their chosen creature's equal suitability as a gatekeeper. Each chapter is an interesting portrait of a human's obsession with one aspect of nature. And this human connection is important. According to Stephen Jay Gould, we need a humanistic ecology as well, both for the practical reason that people will always touch people more than snails do or can, and the moral reason that humans are legitimately the measure of all ethical qualities, for these are our issues, not nature's. The human stories are as important as the animal for grabbing people's attention, especially when the animal is commonly thought unlikable. This is a missing aspect of Warwick's book. All his species are appealing in some way. There is an argument that the toad or the bees of two of his chapters are less so, but they hold an enduring place in our imagination and folklore, as do the sparrows found in another chapter. Not so of the animals in a different book of essays, Trash Animals, How We Live with Nature's Filthy, Feral, Invasive and Unwanted Species. I realise this collection is a distorted mirror of Warwick's book. Its stated aims are very similar. In the foreword of Trash Animals, Randy Malamud, describing the ensuing essays, says... 
They begin with the local and the particular, an encounter between two distinct animals. One is armed with a word processor to initiate a dialogue in a textual realm. The other is pathologically undetermined, framed, and subjectified ad absurdum, but perhaps positioned here to be invited into a more welcoming discourse. While Warwick's animals are generally viewed tolerantly, these animals are actively disliked. They include pigeons, magpies, seagulls, and, of course, the starling. These two sides to dealing with animals are important. Despite some rarities in Warwick's text, such as otters and beavers, both generally deal with common animals and how we see them. I see these two books as two aspects of the discourse about animals. Malamud argues that in our status quo cultural experiences, we are induced to see animals simply, neatly, in frames or cages or tight, concise categories. An animal is a pet or meat or a charismatic megafauna or a cartoon. While Warwick's animals all fit fairly neatly into their correct boxes, trash animals such as starlings do not. The introduction states that the more one learns about a trash animal, the more that animal seems prophetically similar to the human species. Animals that successfully inhabit new environments, alter landscapes, and disrupt ecosystems remind us uncomfortable of ourselves. These ambiguities, according to Arlick and Sanders, are central to the forms of relationships between human and non-human animals. They go on to state that some bad animals are freaks. They do not have a clear place in the social order. Their status is confused and ambiguous because they mix categories that are considered by many people to be pure and sacred. These animals are the urban ones, the invasive ones, the ones which appear to have no cultural or symbolic importance. They remind us of all our bad qualities and none of our good. They are often not even in need of our help, so there's no charitable prize or prestige for caring. Animals like starlings, in transgressing our neat boundaries, bring the pure and beautiful ideal of nature out there into the scruffy and dirty reality. My first encounter with the starling in the kitchen seemed serendipitous and prophetic, a magical moment. Later in the year, they came in every morning and increasingly made a mess. I found their droppings on the tables and chairs, and others started to complain. But it's as important to imagine, to examine these ambiguous, complicated creatures as the pretty boy or girl next door wildlife. I still love the starlings coming in the window because they break the rigid boundary between us and nature, a boundary that may not truly exist, a boundary which deserves to be broken. As Trash Animals editors Nagy and Johnson point out in their introduction, in many cases, by looking more closely at a certain species, contributors see in the animal something to appreciate, perhaps even to revere, something that alters their perspective on the world shared with other animals. Revealing new and interesting information about a species previously unknown or unconsidered, as Warwick does, is vitally important, but even more important is the single species study's ability to change people's minds about a creature previously disliked or dismissed. This change of heart can have a profound effect on someone's mentality, and caring about an unwanted species, as I hope I have effectively argued, can be as important as saving a rare and beautiful one. As Gould famously pointed out, we will not fight to say what we do not love. Thank you. Finishing on a line, we will not fight to save what we do not love. And I think what was so extraordinary for me when I first read this, because although, as I said at the beginning, we've been sponsoring this um, competition from about, for about five years, I'm not a judge. And the first time I see uh, what you're going to hear um, is when we're put, putting together booklets. We have about a hundred of these and they'll be available on a chair um, uh, by that door exit. Although they'll also be available on the, on the, on the ASLE website and the UWTSD website very shortly. And I read this and I just thought this, there are so many layers of meaning in what you've given us today. And that notion that actually looking at the small individual species has huge messages um, for everything else that we do. One thing I haven't told um, Rachel is, is I'm also patron of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. And when I first took that on, I used to meet people who, who looked only at individual species 
And there was a part of me that was sort of thinking, you know, get your head up, <laughs> look out at something else. <clears throat> Until I started to really understand that interrelationship between those individual species and our whole ecosystem in the way that you've described in your, in your meditation. But as somebody who loves nature in the way that you do, what made you choose? What, where was that epiphany moment that you thought, it's murmurations of starlings, though that's the meaning I'm going to explore? Um, well, the talk is an adaptation of my master's dissertation, which I wrote in 2014. Um, and I, I originally had a completely different topic decided at my dissertation. I was going to write about American and British literature and things like that. And then I, I actually, I lived in Brighton for four years and never saw the murmuration. But I went back to visit and was just on, happened to be on the seafront at the right time and looked up and it was going on and it just blew my mind. We were running down the seafront to get onto the pier to see it better and I was just going, I could write about this. I could write so much about this. So, um, and I sort of did. <laughs> so it was literally that, that moment mm -hmm. where you saw something you'd never seen before. Yeah, I'd never seen it before. And it, it, it changed your life then. Yes, in, in the sense of, yeah. you know, not only producing this, but actually giving a whole meaning to the yeah. way that you described what you did. Yeah. Hugely important. Yeah. And, I, and I think what's so uh, interesting there is that your first impulse was to say, I want to write about this. Mm. Um, and that brings you here talking to us tonight. That's fantastic. Um, but why writing? Because I know that you are both a writer and also a practical uh, um, conservationist. Uh, you trained, um, um, uh, as you just said, you wrote a, a, a master's dissertation in the wild writing um, degree at uh, Essex University. But I also know that you volunteered. You were uh, on Flat Home Island for, for six months and um, you are now working for uh, Ecoactive in, in London So, and you, you were a volunteer for the RSPB. So uh, there's, there's, there's two parts of your life, isn't there? There's the writer and there's the conservationist. I just wondered if, you, if you'd like to say more about how those work together, how one helps you with the other, perhaps how one hinders you with the other, and, and whether you, you know, is writing about it as important as doing, or, or, or they both go hand in hand? I think they absolutely need to go hand in hand, and at the moment they don't as much as they could. I mean, they are more and more, but there is this divide between people on the ground, you know, Copsing, digging holes, doing wardens and rangers and academics and writers. And the problem is people won't appreciate the work that is being done practically if they haven't been made to love it by the literature, if that makes sense. Um, and I think there needs to be more of a conversation between these two because there's a bit of mistrust. I, I spoke at a conference um, about the platform um, and it was, a, it was an academic conference about landscapes and lots of people were saying, oh, I've never really spoken to the wardens of the landscape that I'm doing my PhD on and things like that. And I say, no, you, you must, you must go and speak to them. And equally, they're obviously wardens are very busy people, <laughs> but um, there are some really interesting collaborations going on. So there are, um, I can't remember his name, but there's somebody who does these poetry boxes where he puts a box with a notebook in nature reserves and people come across it as they're walking around the nature reserve and they're just invited to write a poem in the book. And um, obviously then you're, you have this whole trove of beautiful literature about your place that can be used to get more people to come to your place and hopefully give you money to keep it looking or keep it biologically diverse or whatever you need to do. Um, but also literarily, it's a beautiful thing to have. Um, I think they, they both have their merits and at the moment there's a bit of a divide and there needs to be less of one. Mm -hmm. can, can, I, can I pick up on, um, in, in the context of writing and nature, I mean, I think that you know, what Robert McFarlane um, has identified in, uh, in Landmarks is extraordinary. You know, taking words that probably most people in, in this audience today have grown up with and removing them from the Oxford Junior Dictionary so we know that the next generation will not grow up with those words. And you were talking about incredibly common words, weren't you? And things like blackberries, yeah. etc., being being removed. How, if people don't have language, how are they going to appreciate? Yeah, so it's it's a complicated one because they were removed in favour of words that were more to do with technology, like Wi-Fi and mobile. And that there was a huge pushback against that, which I don't necessarily agree with. I think they're both important. And the, the divide between technology and nature is another one that 
doesn't necessarily need to be there, they can help each other. But you do need this language. It's the, there's so much in language. Um, in, in the Fuller dissertation, I go into this thing called eco-linguistics, um, where, where you, there are so many links between the loss of language and the loss of species and the loss of knowledge that you get. So when languages die out, you lose a huge range of knowledge about the ecosystem of where that language developed. Um, and it's the same. So as we lose words about nature, we lose the knowledge associated with those words. And that's, that's a real problem. Um, and yes, eco-linguistics, I think, is the study of this, these connections between the two. I mean, I think it's a critically important point, because if you, um, the WWF produced the Living Planet Report um, last year, and it showed we're potentially at risk of, you, of losing something like 70% of our species in this age of the Anthropocene, the first age in the history of the planet where one species has damaged the planet for all others, and that's us. So when we're thinking about if we're, if we're damaging and we're taking the language away mm. to describe it, I mean, that puts us at huge risk, yes. doesn't it, in terms of the uh, future? Yes. Even, even if we can't take the species, at the least still remembering what it was called, but then, of course, lots of the species that are going extinct probably never, never actually got named by us. There are mm. probably species going extinct that we never even discovered, but the ones we do have, we need to keep the names of them at the very least. Um, in common knowledge, because then once you've got a word for something, then you can connect to it, you can identify it, you can sort of, you know, care about it and try and save it. I think um, uh, your, your point about you lose words, you lose culture when you lose species um, is, is a very interesting one. Um, I remember as a child uh, when starlings were a, a lot more numerous than they are today. There were murmurations of, of starlings. Um, and uh, we would see a murmuration and we would cry out, Spitfire, Spitfire, as they went across <laughs> the... Um, now, of course, that little piece of, I guess it must have, you know, uh, um, um, probably that died out in the 1980s or something like that. And uh, uh, that, that, that little piece of, of, of culture amongst children is lost and children would not have that same relationship with, with starlings that perhaps I have. So that one of, is one of the reasons why I grew up um, loving starlings. I'm one of those people, I suspect many of you here tonight are those people who love starlings, absolutely love them. I love the starling that sits on my roof at my home in Northumberland and uh, thinks it's a red shank. So you can hear a red shank and you look up and there's a starling on the roof. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, mine um, sounds like rocks. Do they, they sound like rocks? <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> but, um, but, but, you know, as you mentioned a few times mm. in, in, in your talk, not everybody loves starlings. They are one of a number of species that, um, that some people really don't like. And you mentioned a few of them. I'm wondering, because you know, we really enjoyed this um, talk, what other species are you thinking about writing about? What other species that people don't like um, might you be interested in? Well, as a confession, starlings are not actually my favourite bird. My favourite bird is the herring gull. Starlings are a close second. But God, as a hated bird, the herring gull is up there. People hate herring gulls far more than they hate starlings. Starling, it kind of extends to their bullies on my bird feeder and I wish they'd get off. Um, herring gulls, there are widespread calls to cull them all to extinction. People hate them. And I just love them. I think they're beautiful. I think they're clever. I think they, the range of noises that they make is amazing. And if you watch one, people hate watching them go through bins, but you watch one go through the bins and the ingenuity it has in getting into packaging. And I mean, I, have, I lived in Brighton and I've had a herring bird take a samosa, I think, directly out of my hand. And, um, and it, I just love that. It's an amazing connection. That's a connection with nature, you know. Um, how often do you get that up close to a, to a wild bird? But, um, and of course, I was, I was on Flat Harm for six months, which is, is mostly lesser black bats, and there is a difference, lesser black bats are darker bats and yellow legs, yeah, and, um, but they, they are quite similar, <laughs> but I do love the herring gulls more, but, um, which is a gull colony, and they're, I'm not romantic about them, they are dirty, they are loud, they eat each other's chicks, they, um, they, the island is covered in litter, which is them bringing it over from the mainland. But the reason that they can get that litter is that we leave it on the streets for them to get. Um, and they feed off our rubbish tips and they will catch botulism, which sort of kills them slowly through paralysis. It's really horrible. Um, and there's, I, don't, I don't like romanticizing these sort of hated animals, but I just love knowing about them and getting, getting to know them. And, so I guess if I was going to write about another species, it would be herring gulls. Well, I hope there's no if about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all want to hear it. 
No, absolutely. Um, there's about 10 minutes for questions uh, from the audience. We've got microphones, so would anybody like to ask Rachel a question? There we are. Thank Hi. you. It's microphone coming. Yeah. Hi. Um, you say about people's attitude to the, these hated birds. What can we do about that? Because it comes down to the media, the stories of herring gulls going into a pushchair or taking somebody's chihuahua. You know, <laughs> they're, they're not habitually doing that. <laughs> That's what our media. It gets blown up out of all proportion and, and the hatred increases. And it's difficult. Um, I like to think, so when people came to flat home, I did guided tours, and I'd get quite defensive of the girls quite early on. Um, and I like to think that getting people out there, seeing things like the nest sites, even though it's loud and it's dirty and they poo on you, um, but they, they're brilliant mothers. The chicks are adorable. <laughs> they're ridiculously cute. And saying things like, look, if they've got places like this, like flat farm to nest, then they won't nest in the cities and then they won't be attacking your dogs or whatever. Um, so getting that shift from just get rid of them all to maybe give them somewhere else to live that isn't on your roof and you'll have a better chance. It's, uh, it's like I read somewhere that the best way to deal with pigeons, to reduce pigeon population, is to give them a really nice pigeon loft to live in and let them make all their nests in there and then um, oil the eggs, basically, if you want to reduce. But it's basically doing something nice for the pigeons, but they're getting in with their own. But nobody will fund that because why would you spend all money on building a pigeon loft? We want to get rid of the pigeons. So it's a difficult one. Um, but then just watch them, try and see them with an open mind and try and encourage other, others to. And you know, if you can, get out to see a nest site or something like that. But isn't it about our behaviour? Yes. As well. Yes. Because that. in the context of, you know, they're, they're just doing what they do. Yeah. <laughs> we have choices mm. about what we do. Mm. We're the ones who put the litter exactly. out there for them yeah. to eat. And, uh... yeah. and if you, um, yeah, if there were fewer chicken bones on the streets and there'd be fewer herring gulls on the streets, basically. Um, so those actions are actually part of your, your narrative whereby we decide as a human species that mm. we must be allowed to do what we choose to do and other species have to be accommodated yeah. to us. So there is a sort of inverse uh, dialogue, isn't there, that needs mm. to happen in the, in, in, in the context of the relationship in ecosystems. Yeah. Other questions? Up oh, over there, please. <laughs> Hi, I used to live in Penzance, where we also have no erosion, so the problem with my garden had some great trees that the starlings would nest in, and there would be terrific noise, and then suddenly was a really eerie silence mm. that would go on for a while, and then suddenly they'd all start again. And I wonder what makes this, if it doesn't tail off or anything, it's just mm. immediate. Is that um, an alarm? Do you have any idea why that happens? I'm not sure. I've read people describing this. Yeah, that they, they all go in and then they just they do just sort of cut out. Um, I can only, I don't know exactly, but I imagine it's similar to the murderations where they're all mimicking each other and one stops and they all stop, kind of, there's a ripple and it seems very immediate. They're not. It's yeah. so eerie because it's been so loud. Yeah, there's the. Uh, there's an interesting book that I discovered when I was researching this, which I can't remember the date from, but. Uh, quite a long time, a long time ago, of this guy who was convinced that birds could read each other's minds. It was called Evidence of the Thought Transference <laughs> in Birds. And it was just a list of him writing down times birds had done things at the same time <laughs> as proof. But you know, you can see why he came to that conclusion, because they do do this eerie thing where they all just do this at the same time. But so the memorations don't happen every evening. Why? Do they all just decide not to do it? How come you don't get like half a memoration and the other half going, no, I can't be bothered, you know? It's, and it's not, that's part of what I love about the memoration and a lot of the starling behaviour is we don't actually know why. And that's, and I love the idea that we, there's stuff that we don't know, but I also love the idea that one day we will. And both of those ideas are really exciting. So, yeah. It's one of those examples, isn't it, in nature, and there are many, many of them, where by following very, very simple local rules. This mm. astonishing complexity is built up because it's repeated over and over and over and over again. 
Um, and uh, I guess it's, 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 it's that complexity, which is one of the things that we love, that complexity of behaviour, yeah. which is one of the things we love so much. Definitely.